Um, but um, my name is Rosie. I'm involved in the Irish Housing Network, and the Irish Housing Network there's, um, I think uh, at the moment twenty groups, um, all around the country who are kind of grassroots groups who are working on different housing issues in their area, and this is kind of the first, um, kind of meeting we've had like citywide meeting that we've had about the land grabs that are happening in Dublin. So the focus of the meeting is basically to just to kind of begin talking about how we can all work together uh, to sort of resist it, to inform ourselves about what the plan actually is that Dublin City Council have at the moment. Um, so it's kind of just to kind of get things going a bit with the, on a city-wide scale because there's different groups been doing uh, different work in their own areas. So the layout of the day is basically that we're just going to have a quick presentation about what the grabs actually are. Um, and then questions and answers. Um, um, all right, so I guess uh, I'll start off with um, just a bit of background on um, kind of starting uh, with the kind of arguments behind the plan, um, where the sort of decision making processes are and the power lies, and then kind of the mechanisms that work. And then um, Michelle will go into the plan itself. Um, so on this mic. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, so the argument for the plan. Um, I suppose it's politically unavoidable that uh, there's an emergency level housing crisis. Uh, the current figures I think are 140,000 people on the social housing waiting list, um, 6,300 people homeless last month, uh, including 2,200 people or children homeless. Um, and that's just the Department of the Environment figures, so it doesn't even count the hidden homeless. Um, then according to the Central Bank, there's 92,000 mortgages in arrears, um, I think nearly 2,000 properties repossessed uh, over the past year, and vulture funds are actively buying up debt and evicting people now at 500% like profit. So the argument for the plan is kind of that something is better than nothing. It's better to be doing something, uh, building housing units, uh, and it doesn't really matter, you know, the level or the cost, you just need to do something now. Um, one of the arguments for something like this as well is that uh, local authorities can't borrow. This is because of the, um, the physical compact, the, uh, the EU IMF programme for financial support for Ireland, which states that effective measures are in place to cap the contribution of local government sector to general government borrowing on an acceptable level which means that local governments can't borrow on the books. Uh, so they're saying they can't borrow to build social housing, but actually there's nothing really suggests that they would if they could. So to go through the um, quickly the, the, the decision-making power, how the decisions are made, um, I'll try and through this. So the, uh, the planning process is kind of began in 1963, um, which actually um, initiated uh, plan, the planning system, where local authorities set five-year development plans and appropriate zoning, and developers then have to conform to the plan through uh, getting planning permission. So the local authorities work in two parts, elected councillors representing constituencies, and officers of the local authority who make up the administrative staff, and they're headed by the city or county manager. Now certain uh, functions of the planning would be set or reserved for the um, elected members, i.e. the councillors, um, who would have the power to oversee plans and revoke or modify the planning permission, um, or uh, require a manager to grant permission that goes against the plan. Um, also, if I'm mumbling or going too fast, then you can just like, stop me. Um, so, there was a report in um, 1987 that um, kind of said that business interests didn't really have much influence, the planning process was quite hierarchical and very much by the book. Um, and that's not to say it was great, I mean the public didn't have really any influence either. Uh, one planner who was interviewed by a geographer in 93 about this said that uh, we are expert enough to make it complex enough for the average person not to understand. <laughs> uh, so, this system actually like, didn't really work very well either. I mean, it made planning very difficult because it wasn't linked together. For example, land use and transport were actually completely separate. Like the transport planning was uh, done by the transport authority differently or separately. And um, during boom times of development, the planners would get flooded with applications for planning. And during um, lulls in developments, there's no real power to build. 
So the change kind of began in the mid 1980s. Um, the government was very concerned with 45% uh, unemployment in the construction industry, and the inner city was kind of falling apart. So they took a page out of Margaret Thatcher's book and promoted promoted regeneration through financial incentives to developers and investors in uh, designated areas. And this went kind of it, it took some power away from the uh, local authority planners and um, created agencies in key areas. One example of this is the Custom House Docks Development Authority. And they were given um, uh, the power to, to set planning zones and give planning permission that kind of went over the heads of the uh, planners. Um, one planner again in field said, I don't know who's drawing up these boundaries, what the functional reason for them is, and I'm not involved at all. The central government accountability is not really clear. Without being conspiratorial about it, <laughs> <laughs> there is a golden circle with entrepreneurs, the Department of Environment, the Department of Finance, and special structures set up, set up in a comfortable relationship with the private sector. So in the mid-90s, um, as part of this process, the Dublin City Manager actually uh, was given a lot more concentrated power, and planners who challenged the power, which again were very much in line with developers' interests, um, there's a planner who said, I like the idea of working with the public, you weren't compromised, you're a free agent, you have security of tenure, now it's changed. You're really working for the manager, the manager is working for the development sector, the development sector is part of the budget system. Um, another kind of change through this was, um, uh, there was a 1996 report called the Better Local Government uh, Report, which again shifted power further. So the Corporation Planning and Development Committee, um, which was a uh, kind of arm of the local authorities planning, uh, was replaced with SBCs or strategic political committees. Now there was a um, the the original uh, uh, planning development committee would have had a county planner. Um, this was replaced with the director of services. So part of this report was like all about making more streamlined, whatever. Um, but crucially, while kind of the head of water services would have to be an engineer, or the head of technical services would have to have some kind of technical background. The director of planning didn't have to be a planner. Um, and that was like intentionally because they didn't really have any power and they weren't supposed to. So that's kind of um, the uh, where the, it's, it's the decision making power basically comes from the city manager, which again is in line with the Department of Environment, which is in line with the developer's interests. So the housing land initiative is kind of funny because it's a pilot project. Um, it's not a special development zone or SDZ, which I'll get to in a sec, but it's actually following all the, it has all the hallmarks of a special development zone. Um, so it's a part, I, I, my kind of theory is that they're, they're, they're just taking the processes from SDZ off the shelf um, for this pilot project. So to go through a little bit of uh, where the, how these processes work and where they came from, um, Special development zones, or strategic, sorry, rather strategic development zones, were introduced to uh, to kind of streamline and facilitate development that the state deems socially or economically important. Um, so the Minister of the Environment, now housing, uh, I think, um, has the power to designate a site for to basically make it a special development zone. The Docklands is a special is a strategic development zone. Um, so two, there's two main features. One is that uh, once it's approved by the planning board, on board Plan Ella, uh, the local authority is obliged to grant planning permission. Um, so if it's consistent with the aims of the SDZ, then you're not allowed to use planning permission. Um, and the planning authorities have power of compulsory purchase within the zone. Um, so this is introduced uh, in 2000 um, as an amendment to the 1967 Act. Or, yeah, and it was basically an act of deregulation uh, that gave advantages to developers and improved the profitability of the development process, um, basically to uh, amend perceived delays. Um, and it also uh, it also meant they could divide up the um, the zone into different schemes. So that's again something that's happening here: uh, different plots being um, being tendered by different. Um, applications. Um, so it, it kind of helps developers uh, take on more manageable schemes in ways that are more suited to market conditions and there's less commitment and less risk. But obviously I mean it's, it's totally, it, it undermines the strategic part of it um, and it also means there's much less public participation. And 
much less uh, ability to object. So, um, one thing that developers have always wanted was to have pre-application discussions with the planners in order to say, well, if we do this, would you object? If, what would you have to do? Um, so the 2000 Act made actual provisions for this. There was no, the, the, they didn't, um, they weren't really able to before that. Um, <coughs> the 2000 Act said, uh, you can meet up with the, um, with the planners and go through the plan and basically, uh, basically save time in theory, but um, it, 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 kind of, it, it creates informal relationships and it's another stage where there's no public participation. So if you iron out the problems before anyone has a chance to object, then there's much less time to object. Um, so the 2000 Act also created a section for something called strategic infrastructure. Now, I, I think that the, um, this initiative, the, the applications made by developers would have been through this legislation for strategic infrastructure. Um, there was another amendment in 2006 which made two changes. Uh, it expanded the categories for what can be applied for in strategic infrastructure to like 28 or something, um, which again is much more opportunities to get automatic planning permission. And also, um, it, so the, the planning board, the way it works, or the way it worked, was um, it was an independent semi-judicial body that if you are refused planning permission, you can appeal to the planning board. Um, and what the 2006 Act said is instead of having the um, pre-application meetings where you iron out any potential problems with the planners first, 2006 said you can actually meet with the guys who are going to either give you your appeal or not. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually cuts out the council from, like the, the, the council can then say, oh, well, we're not going to give you final permission. And I said, well, the guys who are making the decision about if you're overturning your decision already said we can, so whatever. <laughs> um, so basically it means the planning authorities no longer are planning authorities or have decision-making power. <laughs> and no play again, there's no public consultation for this, no potential to object. Um, and it actually means that the independent planning board actually are the ones making the decisions. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good place to jump into the uh, the panel stuff. Yeah, okay. So that was that was pretty good. I mean, looking at these, you kind of be wondering why, why, how did that happen? Um, and that's why. There we are. That's great. Thanks, Tom. Um, so start at the beginning. Um, starts in the Housing Land Initiative. That's Dublin City Council's um, initiative. We call it an initiative to. Um, to build on several of their sites that they have around the city. Simply put, that's what that is. Um, and it starts off kind of in July 2014. Um, they start to assess the vacant lands that they own uh, with view to building on them. Obviously, you know, more, more houses do need to be built. And they have all this land, why wouldn't they be building on it? Um, they were initially considering five empty sites, um, but after various un unspecified kind of um, consultations, let's just say, they decide we own, there's three of them that we like most, so we'll concentrate on the three of them first. Um, so in, um, they consult with the market in 2015. They, or, they advertise in the media for people to come and talk to them about building, um, specifically developers. Um, you can see there, so there was um, builders and developers, for 24 of them, uh, and project managers, engineers and architects involved with them, uh, 14 estate agents, 10 investors, whatever that means, 8 approved housing bodies, and 2 modular housing specialists, and as well as consortia from Ireland and the UK, combining all or some of the above. Which sounds really nice and delightful. <laughs> so none of these are named. We don't know who any of these guys are. Um, there have been many, I think a few requests from different councillors, as far as I know, for these names to be released. Um, whenever, um, whenever these are requested, they are told that that's it won't add anything. <coughs> and that they're commercially sensitive. Is that the words they Market sensitive. Market sensitive. Yeah. So they don't want to tell us who they're talking to. They don't have to as well. And the, for the, the reasons for that are kind of what Tommy sort of broke down there a minute ago. Um, so great. <laughs> um, their lands are going to be developed by the private sector. Uh, a certain percentage of units will be retained for below cost rental. We don't 
in, in a lot of the plans, it's not that clear how high the percentage should be. Um, there's also very little um, indication of how <coughs> this below cost rental will be regulated. Um, below cost rental will basically be um, the, it's th there's a rent cap of some some description. Uh, the rent will be to pay for the cost of building and for the cost of maintenance ongoing. So not really very profitable for a developer. I don't know a single developer who would go for that, really. So they're going to have to really be whipped in order to do that. So I, I, I don't know. Um, so after they were talking to these various market forces, unnamed um, market forces, they, it seems that there was a serious interest in O'Devney Gardens and St. Michael's Estates. Now these weren't originally been considered at all. Um, these were not part of the five original sites. They're not empty. Do you know, they still, they already have a lot of building on them. They actually will require a lot of prep work. But obviously the guys in these, um, these, these builders, these developers, um, saw these two hot pockets of land and uh, <laughs> started saying, how about them? Um, and DCC said, sure, yeah, why not? Please. Um, so there you go. So we're going to have a quick look at the plans. If you want to just get to the next, um, next slide there. Thank you. So there you go. Um, Oscar Trainer Road is the first one, um, the second one is O'Devney Gardens, and the third one is St. Michael's Estate, which is in Inchicore. The man who knows the most about Oscar Trainer in this room is probably Alan. If you, you want to just run through, uh, I mean, it's all there, but if you want to yeah, say it. Yeah, I'll do say it uh, on that one. Yeah. The red right. site that they say there is Grandfield, so it, it differs from O'Devney and Michael's, that there was never any housing on it now far. As long as I've lived in Kerrock 40 years, there's rumours of them building all sorts on it. About 15 years ago, they were building uh, a kind of multiplex picture house and, and something else that kind of never went ahead. So it's it has always been a proposed site for some sort of development or the other. And there's, there's always been objections to certain developments going ahead on it. The actual site that you see there is parceled up into five different sites with developers tending for a, a site kind of each. They run, they roughly run, there's one along here at the back of Larkin. There's one up here where there'll be a hotel, a couple of thousand foot uh, retail units. There's one here, one there, and then the smallest one is here in the, the corner. There'll be tower blocks here, and the hotel and all things, a couple of boy royals coming down the Oscar trainer. As regards the 30% social housing, a lot has been kind of lumped in under social housing. There's, as you can see there, 74 working class old, old style social housing if you're on the waiting list. Affordable rental is, it's a bland term and no one seems to know what that means. Are you renting off the council? Are you renting off private landlords? And then in the same, you have 40 senior citizens and within that there's a couple of independent living units. In, in the five sites, there's kind of 10 social housing and a couple of affordable housing on each site, apart from the one over here by the roundabout, where the two tower blocks are. There is the old folks, the independent living, and um, I think 18 of the social housing and uh, another 32 affordable rental. So people kind of coming through on the social level will be more hemmed on the one side than the other four. Mm -hmm. Now it, it's not it's not a great place now if you are living in a tower block, you're, you're looking out over the, the main road, you have the power tunnel right there beside you. It's uh, very nice. I couldn't actually see people paying money for houses mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So kind of just the end of the site that has the most problems is going to encompass the social element of the site. 
from our couple of meetings that we had, there's objections on all sorts of fronts. A lot of it it be traffic, because as you can see, Bongman Hospital there. This is this is big what we call the top of the scheme, which is just the top of our housing scheme. You know, all around here is an overflow car park for people going in and out of the hospital that just don't want to pay parking. So we park in the estate and walk around into the hospital. Over this side of the road, there's apartments down there and then there's all that grind you get around the college with is living in there, bringing our kids to school. It takes about 35, 40 minutes to get out onto the main road. There's a, a Gale school down here and a, a National Club football club. The road is notorious for traffic. So the way the locals look at it is, if there's another 700 houses built, all poured now onto the same road, it, it's just, it's not, you'd be <coughs> an hour and a half getting our kids out of the state to, to bring them to school. Uh, we, in the in the means we've had, we've, we've had no objections to kind of social housing. I thought we may have heard, no, we don't want social housing, but most people seem to be on board. You know, the, it's more lack of consultation with the community. No one has coined it. No one has heard. The, the first people heard of this was getting same posters up, inviting them to public meetings. There's been no consultation at all with the community. John Lyons, he said there was consultation. John Lyons asked how the consultation went, and he just refused to kind of answer. You know, so whoever they were consulting, God knows, you know, they just, they just can't be found. <laughs> but, uh, so there, there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple of objections. People, traffic, lack of social housing, and then, you know, you'd, you'd have yeah. one, one or two other reasons why, why people ob object to it, do you know? Mm -hmm. Andrew, do you want to try that in there? Well, we've had three meetings, um, one in Larkin, um, like in our, our campaign is to try to tie, it's just, essentially because of that site is, it's kind of uh, divided and segmented the M50 and stuff like that, the, we had a meeting up on Sandy up that part and some of, the, some of that estate is actually in another constituency. Uh, in Central Queen's Centre, we had another meeting in in um, in Larkin itself, uh, on Larkin Avenue there, and another meeting over uh, over in Kilmore, taking in the Castle Time. So you had Castle Time, Larkin, and Sandry. And what the three meetings gave out was that one, uh, people just didn't know what was going on. So the consultation thing is correct. There's there's no uh, you know uh, consultation with the, with the local communities. Uh, there there may be an element in in all the areas of people say, well, I don't want any any building, I don't want any social housing or whatever. There might, might be a bit of a nimbyism going on there, but uh, we canvassed these areas, these streets, talking to people on the streets and knocking on the doors, and the responses, and uh, was they didn't see any, they didn't have any problems with social housing, but uh, is anything going to be built there? And if something's going to be built there, they think it's going to be a mess, it's going to be a disaster, right? That's from the start. Just. A small note on Oscar Trainer Road, 1959 was the first meeting with the local people in Larkin, with the councils. That's when Dublin City Council was bigger. We came from Malahide and whatever. They all met the locals and promised them that that was going to be the next St. Anne's Park. And they had a great plan for it was going to be this. Within a week, it was rezoned as housing. Hmm. So they, they met the locals, said, oh yeah, we're going to do this for you. But they made sure that it was never going to happen this idea. So since then there was plans for a bowling alley, sports complex and so forth and so forth. So that's, it's been going on with local people there, not, not just in Larkin but in Santry, uh, 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 even the Castle Time area, all are aware for decades there's been something going on there but nothing has ever happened. So the Housing Land Initiative, as far as when we talked to people uh, in stalls or say shops and talked, knocked on the doors, was, uh, are they going to do anything? We've been doing something since 1959, uh, simple as that. But 
one argument that um, we, 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 we look put forward as far as the as this this is concerned in this area uh, was that well uh, if if you were against social housing how would you like and how would you propose social housing uh, would would be and we proposed well okay well if you increase the threshold uh, income threshold to access public housing forget about common uh, social health, but public housing mm -hmm. and if you did that most of the grandchildren or children in these estates who don't live here anymore they actually live outside uh, they live in Scaries, they live in Blanchestown, they don't live in there, they have to travel to see their grandparents, their, ch their children or whatever, or their parents. So if you increase the threshold, maybe you can have 60-70% public housing on that on that plot of land. Uh, so that local people, and, and, and beyond, but local people could live in an area beside the local schools uh, uh, and access uh, locally to, to their parents. And that wouldn't exclude anyone from who, who's on the housing list or whatever, would they? You know, gain access to public housing, but uh, that immediately was. Um, could we? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Could no, we, could we, we think that like, yeah, yeah, come yeah. down to could okay. that start demand, demand, yeah. demand? But stuff just, like just that. to finalise it, though, there's a big green bit in the middle called the park, and when I, when you show people the the, the initiative, um, was like, was that that'll just be a field? <laughs> people have no faith yeah. in it, you know. Mm. Sorry, I'm not speaking too long. It's so not. No, well, no, we can definitely come back to stuff yeah. like that in the demands and then in the last section. I didn't, that, no, that was good to get a bit of, kind of insider knowledge on that because I didn't know that about the park. <coughs> It'd be the next St. Anne's Park. Mm. Not, you want to say yeah, sure, so yeah. um, Just for those who don't know, Edge of Stoney got her right beside the Phoenix Park. Um, there were um, public private partnerships on them uh, about to go ahead and that in around like, you know, the early 2000s and it failed in 2008 when the developers all went. Um, so it's been, you know, up for rejuvenation for a very, very long time, um, and there's about eleven, maybe twelve families still there, as far as I know. Do you know? There's nine families. Nine left. families now. Okay, yeah. There you go. So uh, is there uh, and there are you as well on um, oh, Odevni? Oh, Odevni. Yeah. yeah. Water, so I in. suppose um, just to to clarify, Odevni and Saint Michael's both had fa lots of families in the past, mm -hmm. but Saint Michael's has been completely detenanted. The remaining tenants have moved into the what has been the, the rejuvenation over the generation that has been done there. So Devney is actually the only um, site that still has families remaining. And the, the particular impact, I suppose, that's relevant for this group is that it kind of changes the nature of a campaign and that, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the campaign is that there are nine families um, who still have contracts with Dublin City Council. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there was three, I think, failed regeneration attempts. The last one was around 2012, and there was a new master plan developed for the entire site at that point that is still, um, in theory, the guiding document for the Housing Land Initiative. So those last two options there, option one and option two, um, those are the two, um, the two options that are now being taken on for the Housing Land Initiative. Um, so I suppose the significant things in terms of the balance of the housing they're planning to develop is that there's, um, you see, you can see there on the bottom left hand corner, that's um, an empty site um, that's uh, owned by the Department of Defence currently. And um, that has now been made part of the block that they're considering um, Odebney Gardens. It's actually uh, further away than it looks. It's quite an isolated site. The gate is right down there at the end of Infirmary Road towards the Criminal Courts of Justice. So there's no link between the two sites physically. And um, there, I suppose it, that, that has now been zoned for social housing. Um, when they, that was done before they um, put the two sites in together. So before the Housing Land Initiative was signed off on, um, that site had been um, earmarked for um, public housing. And um, there was kind of an informal guarantee given to the current residents of Odebney Gardens that they would be rehoused there. That was before anything started to be discussed around with Ebony Gardens. Then the funding kind of became, was withdrawn in some way. And after that, um, the two sites became um, one, one block. So I guess from that, um, a concern is that the um, quota of social housing will all be put into the site down at the bottom of the infirmary road, um, which is actually quite pretty in a lot of ways, but um, is quite isolated also. Um, a friend is uh, a friend is an architect who mentioned that the building that's in there is a listed building and it's um, if it was renovated it'd be extremely high value and so that would make you think that possibly they will try and put something higher value into that site but at the moment it looks like it's going to be public housing. So then in Odebney Gardens itself um, 
can see the units there, the breakdown um, that they're talking about. Um, the, the, they haven't gone into detail. There's supposed to be a meeting in mid-May to give the um, prop full breakdown of the plan for Odebney Gardens. And that didn't happen. We weren't given a reason as to why it wasn't happening. Um, we were then told that they were going to wait until after um, Alan Kelly, or what's his name, Simon Coveney's housing plan, um, to, to, have, to flesh out the plans for, um, for Odebney Gardens. And um, the plan, um, and that, obviously that happened last week, um, there aren't any council meetings in theory in August, um, but uh, my Fe our Fianna Gael councillors um, think that that meeting um, to discuss with Emily Gardens is probably going to be called in August. So we put a foot motion forward saying that it shouldn't be called in August because obviously a lot of people are away, there's going to be less opposition in August, um, but uh, I, I would assume that they're going to try and have that meeting at some point in August so that they can go ahead um, with uh, with um, pushing with getting sign off on the plan in the September council meeting. Yeah, I was just going to say um, there was some case now maybe maybe I picked this up on you can correct me if so in around April or so when the demolition order was put for the last remaining four blocks, the families were still in their word post. The first they heard of it was I think there was a notice up or something like that. Is so that true? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So do okay. So they're just not consulting. Yeah. I'll, Yes, yeah, so the um just in terms of site, I'll just there's a couple of other things that I think are really relevant. So one is that um the only detail we've got given about what's going to be built there is that they think that the site is particularly useful for the affordable <coughs> rental that they've been discussing. So it sounds I mean obviously it suits the demographic of the area, which is high rental, high kind of um young kind of people, the high student levels, that they would think that it's profitable to have affordable rental there. Now I, I think it's worth pointing out there actually is a lot of clarity around what the affordable rental will look like. Um, so both in the Housing Land Initiative and in the new government housing plan, they specify that the, what they mean by affordable is that a cap will be put on what tenants can pay um, based on a percentage of their income, but that the actual rent attached to the apartment will be in line with market rents. So um, a market rent is the only matter at the moment, it's about €1,500 Euro for a two bed. Um, if you have somebody on an average income of 35000 a third of their income would work out at about €800 or €900 Euro a month. Um, so the entire difference of 600 euro a month um, would be paid by the government um, to a private developer. And the um, government plan um, says that there's a fund of 10 million euro a year, which they estimate will deliver 2,000 of these four, um, affordable rental units. So that works out at 416 euro a month um, per unit um, of a subsidy from the government to private developers. So the idea is that they, you know, they keep talking about how they want to professionalise the private rental sector. <laughs> so the way to, I mean, there is like, there is a rationale that we don't want all these crappy one-off landlords, but at the same time, like the way that they're doing it is by encouraging them to come in, manage 100 units and get a 416 euro per unit subsidy directly from the state um, to the landlord. So it seems that that's what they're going to push forward with Odebney Gardens. Um, in terms of the campaign then, I suppose what has been done so far, there's been two meetings with the residents themselves. Uh, residents are quite cautious about engaging in a campaign. They're really supportive of the site being used um, fully for public housing. And um, similar to what Andrew was discussing, the proposal we've been putting forward is that be 100% public housing, but with a broader group of people coming into that. Um, and the, uh, so the, the residents have been really supportive of that, but they are kind of um, holding off to hear what they're going to be told from the council. Obviously, because there are nine residents that are left there, there's more of a um, more of a likelihood that they will be kind of um, encouraged one by one um, to take an offer that's made of an existing house. So their primary concern at the moment is um, that they want building to start on the other half of the site um, before they're asked to move out of their houses so that they're guaranteed that public houses will be built on site for them to move into because obviously they've been let down so many times. So in terms of the demolition then, which is the other relevant piece of information, um, the, as you said, the notice went up without um, uh, residents being consulted. It was leaked into the media. Um, it came before a central area committee meeting um, in May. Uh, so at that meeting, what um, the councillors for this area put forward, actually across the board, was that councillors shouldn't be signing off on a demolition order before residents have been told that their homes are going to be demolished. It's mm -hmm. nice obvious. But, um, <laughs> and, and what we were told at that meeting is that, in fact, we didn't have the um, authority to 
um, reject it, that it was just something for us to note. <laughs> um, what's interesting is that, so we had to go ahead, we were given a guarantee that a consultation would take place. What they did, as um, as Dave, as Alan was saying, um, you know, the definition of consultation is a bit odd sometimes. So they asked uh, the guy who manages the estate to knock at everybody's door. Um, he talked to four families and they said they would talk to everybody else to tell them what was happening. That was it. That's literally all that's happened. Um, that, there's now an emergency meeting being held on Monday night to process that demolition order. And that demolition order is um, in, in, that, in the report for that meeting, it said that the central area councillors accepted the um, proposal to demolish the flats. Which clearly isn't what happened. Sorry, Oshin's trying to get me to speed up, but I will, I will speed up. I just wanted to be kind of up to date because it's only happened in the last few days. Mm, that's great. And um, yeah, so like, so this demolition order, I mean, what's interesting is that, um, you know, there's been three deferred demolition orders for the two blocks that are detented because of the amount of fires that have been happening there all the time. And, um, and you know, residents have been really pushing for this to happen, but it keeps being deferred and deferred and deferred because it costs a lot of money. And then all of a sudden, two weeks ago, they call an emergency meeting on the 25th of July, um, which like people are on holidays for and stuff like that. Um, and all of a sudden it's urgent. So I think it's quite likely that they view um, a completely cleared site as um, necessary to getting commercial interest um, in developing it. And the, um, just the other contradiction is that all of the remaining tenants have been given a legal guarantee that they don't have to move out of their homes um, at any point, um, which obviously contradicts the application to demolish their homes. Um, and then just finally, um, one thing that's worth bearing in mind is that um, the 250 <coughs> families or 350 families who were asked to leave O'Devney Gardens so that it could be regenerated, they were all given a legal guarantee that they could return to O'Devney Gardens when it was regenerated. <coughs> Um, and they mostly live in Denars in Cabra, and that group of people are strongly on board with the campaign. Dublin Southern Housing has done kind of two series of door knocking around there, and um, they're very, very on board with um, a regeneration. But Dublin City Council has said that it's no longer a regeneration, it's now a demolition project. Mm. And because of that, the letters they were given are um, null and void. So another possible strand of work is to try and gather those letters. Um, we haven't had any success with that so far, but to try and gather those letters and um, uh, and and try and challenge that definition. So okay, cool. That's Thanks. definitely something to talk about yeah, later. Yeah. Um, is there more on the presentation? There is. Yeah, there's a little. We might skip through. Yeah, the next because it's not in our. Uh, yeah. Well, just I'll just show you the thing. Yeah. Um, uh, so Michael's image core. Um, also up for the whole thing, um, it's a lot smaller than Oscar Trainer. It's about roughly the same size, I think, in area as, as O'Devney. Um, existing master plan from its um, public-private partnership in, that failed in 2008. Um, and then that was like based on long-term consultation processes sorry, with tenants. Um, and I, I don't think there's anyone still living on it. Um, I think everyone it's pretty much gone. They might be living very nearby, um, but they're not living there anymore. Um, there's a weird, there's something weird going on with the zoning of this, um, where the Department of Environment won't allow it to be zoned for anything other than private. And there was some very unclear stuff going on where DCC were trying to get them to agree to have some social, because everything in the housing land initiative has to have originally 10% social housing. Recently, that was bumped up to 30% social housing. Um, so there's potential for about 300 units there, um, like that would only be 30 social units if it was 10%. Mm -hmm. Even with 30%, that's 90 social units or mm -hmm. A lot of them are supposed to be senior citizen units, grand, but you know, come on. Part of the lands are owned by the HSE, the top part, the top northern part, and there's a pigeon club in the top uh, left corner, or sorry, yeah, top left corner, <laughs> uh, which apparently also would have to be um, Re relocated, and I'm not really sure what the story of that is. Poor pigeons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there you go, that's St. Michael's. Now, just go back. Very nice. Can I say two words about St. Michael's? Is it two words? Yes, two words. Well, <laughs> all right. 15 words. All right, all right, <laughs> We're cool. counting. Just, just because, I think, mean, you know, um, so just one thing, like I said, DCC changed the definition of Odebony Gardens from a regeneration site to a demolition. And that meant they have a lot more leverage about what they can do. St. Michael's Estate still has a regeneration committee. and. Mm -hmm. 
they're really like they're under huge pressure to um get to get rid of that because of the fact that once it's gone there's basically no structure that defines the site as being a regeneration site um, so I think that's a really part, important part of the campaign. And then just in terms of that weird zoning that Michelle was talking about, um, Torrington Heights has been developed um, to rehouse about 50 families, I think. <coughs> and basically what the Department of the Environment are saying is that that was a loan, the money for that was a loan, and that the privatisation of the rest of the site needs to be used to repay the value of that loan. Um, so that's what they're using to justify it. And just to say there's an organised campaign there, and um, they're currently... Um, yeah, holding consultations, trying to get residents back who, who had similar to Odeffany Gardens been told they could be moved back onto the site. And at the moment, their focus is on having kind of 50% social, um, which is definitely defined as social rather than like senior citizens and all that. Mm -hmm. um, so just very quick, one point, and then we'll probably pretty much done. Yeah, we've got yeah. a, way more info there than I expected. <laughs> it was great. Um, in April 2015, there was this plan to uh, refurbish Odebney Gardens to house people who were otherwise going to be living in emergency accommodation. Um, so it was Odebney Gardens and Crog Phillips as well. Um, this is Alan Kelly put this forward. Now, there were various reasons for objecting to this plan. One was obviously, you know, the residents weren't really consulted and they don't want a load of people to be dumped in there. It could become a bit of a ghetto. Those are obviously very big, um, they're really obviously very big um, reasons to not do this or very big, but they're good objections. They're totally valid. But well, an interesting point about this, uh, just that's relevant to the Housing Land Initiative, is uh, the cost of refurbing these was roughly 4.27 million, so about 5 million, right? And one of the reasons for throwing this out, and Chrissy Burke said this, he was the Lord Mayor at the time, he said that spending 5 million euro on homes to be demolished was a pure waste of taxpayers' money. Fair enough. But from January to September of 2015, not even the full year, DCC spent 4.5 million on emergency accommodation in hotels and to charities. Yeah. Um, so that was while that was happening in April 2015. That was while they were talking to these unknown consortium of developers about redeveloping the sites. There you go. Okay, so <laughs> my case. now I think we can the, these guys can field questions yeah. for a couple of minutes. Mm. I would ask if it's like you want clarification on personal points of information? The lads are here at the break. You know what I mean? Like we don't need a break. Certain, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're losing your break anyway. <laughs> no, <laughs> but if, if you want to address questions, maybe just for we'll see how the questions go. But I'll cap it at five or six minutes anyway. Yeah, just to kind of conclude that. I mean, um, the the when when they put out the um, when when the, the housing land initiative was being developed at the very early stages, I was talking about how there was provisions for. Um, uh, to have pre-application discussions when developers say, oh, if I did this plan permission, would you object? Um, this, they actually put an ad, uh, when they said, oh, we're going to do this housing land initiative, they put an ad said, um, uh, we're exploring, uh, we're aiming at starting a dialogue with all parties, whether they're venture capitalists, financiers, <laughs> investors, <laughs> developers, or a building consortium. <laughs> <laughs> That's everybody, right? <laughs> So I mean, like the, this was a plan actually like put forward by the yeah. plan was put forward and said, the market, what do you have to say? Let's do that. Yeah. Uh, and so like the the in the plan there is there is no security of tenure. There's no rent controls. Um, the, even the social housing is is uh, there's provisions in the plan that it be managed by associated housing bodies who have no real duty of care. And the thing is like NAM actually could borrow. Um, off books to, to build such housing if they wanted to, but again, it's like not a priority at all. Um, and the thing is, because it's mostly market rents, you know, part of the social housing includes affordable renting, which is still a market rent. So actually, the plan will actually increase rent. Yeah. It'll increase rent in the city. 